supposedly the sun. Uh, my name is Casey Clements, and I'm an emergency physician. I work down the road at the Mayo Emergency Department. Um, and I've been involved with the Southeast Minnesota Regional Crisis Center since well before it was built. And they asked me tonight to give a little bit of that history because we just celebrated three years of serving people. <laughs> And also, by the way, 
we want it open 24 seven where people can come in whenever they, they're having this problem because mental illness and crises don't just happen from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And um, much to our, you know, much to the thanks of the, the state, um, they put a, that law into place and they, they created a funding mechanism to create crisis centers around the state. And so then we built a consortium with 10 counties in Southeast Minnesota, Olmstead Medical Group, Mayo Clinic, and the, the National Alliance for Mental Illness in Southeast Minnesota now. And we put together a shared governance model, and we proposed a facility that Olmstead County would be able to build if given the money for this. And we were one of two that actually got those competitive dollars awarded to us. And um, so we had this beautiful building, and I remember when we were going through facilities design, and just so you guys know, I had to do multiple facilities design projects, not my skill set. Okay. Um, I'm picking windows and doorknobs is definitely not something I did. Um, but when, when we were designing this, I remember at every step thinking, how do we build this in a way that I would want my family or my friends to be here? And I don't know if you've been out to the CERT, but it's phenomenal. And it, and it really is designed that way. And every operational decision that came up, that was the guiding principle. And so when we built this facility, it came time to hire an operating partner. And we put out a request for proposals. And thankfully, Nexus Family Healing um, put in one. And they said, we would love to help run this and go down this unique journey with you. And we said, sounds good. Are you aware that the governance for this will be 10 counties and NAMI and Homestead Medical Center and Mayo Clinic in a shared board model? And they went, well, let's give it a try. <laughs> and, and honestly, it's been phenomenal. And so this is not Nexus's center alone, all right? This is not Mayo Clinic Center. This is not Homestead Medical Center. This is not Homestead County Center. This is not NAMI Center. This is our community center. And I think that's extremely unique and powerful. And so fast forward then to July of 2021. For those of you who remember, it was like a bajillion degrees <laughs> sitting on the tarmac. Um, and that's Senator Senjum on the right cutting the ribbon when we opened for our first patients. Um, and so, that guiding principle of this is our community center continues. And there were some stipulations that we put into place that I think you guys may not know about. Um, but one of those is, is that this has to serve youth in crisis. Youth in crisis is not funded in general by traditional means. Um, medical assistance in Minnesota does not fund youth crisis housing. And so when we said we have to do this, it's essentially, it's standing up for the principle of that's the right thing to do. But, you know, the legislature has said they're going to fund youth crisis housing, but the actual rate is several years off from being set. And so we are all paying into this um, as, a, as the right thing to do for our community. And so I'm, uh, I personally have donated to CERT, and I think other people should consider doing that as well. I really feel like this is something that our community needs. Um, and for a little bit about the programming operations and day-to-day -day stuff, I'm going to hand it over to Nicole. Um, Joanne did give me a script, by the way, but I don't, I don't follow scripts. So. <laughs> <laughs> Based on premise, and now I need to follow that up, right? To everyone who came out tonight, um, especially Dr. Michelle Murray, um, as well as some of our board members that came out. Um, also those from Mayo and other stakeholders that are here and represented, um, just really appreciate um, everybody coming out tonight to support the work that we do. Uh, one of the things that I just wanted to start off with is that in the recent years, um, the Community Health Needs Assessment has indicated that the top three health priorities from Olmstead as well as the other nine counties across the Southeast Minnesota um, have been in the areas of mental health, substance use, and access to care. CERT services and the care model as we get into it, and I give you a little description about what that looks like, 
um, is serving the access to care, the uh, accessing services for mental health needs, as well as addressing some of the substance use concerns within our communities. The need for CERC was evident years ago, as Dr. Clements mentioned, and remains very high today. As noted, mental health has been identified as a top priority, and the suicide rates in Minnesota has increased over the past 10 years, and is higher in greater Minnesota than in the metro. In 2022, we had one of the highest rates for suicide. Um, we had 860 Minnesotans die by suicide. This was the um, seen as a, there was a slight decline that was seen in 2023 at 815. Um, and as we talk a little bit about the services that CERC offers, one of the top reasons that individuals are accessing CERC is um, for suicidal ideation and thoughts of suicide. So a little bit about CERC. Um, our uh, main goal is to provide 24-7 mental health stability uh, for residents of Southeast Minnesota experiencing distress. And this has really been the goal of the board as well as uh, Nexus and operating this facility is that we provide a 24-7 level of access to mental health services when people need it within our communities. That we provide non-judgmental care, collaborating with our partners, and the collaboration across um, all of these organizations that Dr. Clements mentioned earlier has been outstanding. Um, and promote emotional well-being in our community. Some of the ways that we are unique in this is that community collaboration as well as the services and supports that we receive through all the, that community collaboration um, and the investments that community partners like Mayo Clinic make every day to the Southeast Regional Crisis Center in ways such as uh, telehealth being uh, available to all of the individuals free of charge to anyone to access physical health care at the same time that they're meeting their uh, mental health needs. And that's just part of that uh, uh, collaboration that's been extremely beneficial to those that are accessing services. Because we know that mental health and physical health don't always stand alone. Um, and that the mental health journey isn't linear um, and that we are constantly needing to offer a multitude of services as we offer crisis services within our community. CERC offers, it offers three levels of service. Um, one of those is the crisis intervention services. So anyone can walk in, um, regardless of age, 24-7, um, or they can call in for services and receive access to a crisis assessment, which would assess their needs, provide some level of intervention, and access to resources. We uh, then, from there, um, the individual may discharge home with a safety plan and um, be a part, continue to be a part of their community with access to additional resources like outpatient or psychiatry services. If the individual needs a longer stay, they then may uh, uh, go into our crisis residential services. Now this is 10 days short term access to residential care uh, where individuals can stabilize in a setting with uh, mental health uh, workers, practitioners, uh, mental health professionals, our direct care staff, uh, to provide groups and individual services to individuals in need. And then we also have crisis bridging services. One of the things that we found as we were starting CERC was a gap in the ability to access community-based services within their community. And so we were able to establish uh, bridging services that look like outpatient and psychiatry services that are short-term, up to three sessions of therapy and or psychiatry services to help bridge that gap to get them to their community-based services. Um, so we really wanted to provide that crisis level of intervention for everyone that was walking through our doors. A little bit about uh, the impact that we've had over these past three years. Um, we have served 2,700 individuals um, since 2021. 864 have been children and 1,836 have been adults. 800, uh, Think about that, nearly 1,000 children in our area have needed our help in just three years. And as Dr. Clevitz noted, there are few resources for youth mental health crisis care, and we're proud that we can be one of the service providers offering that service. Here you can see by year that we've grown year over year in our service delivery, and that this continues to be a need that we have within our community. 
and that here in 2024, we're expected to exceed our rates um, and serve about 1,292 individuals. Yeah. Do we have any sort of um, data on people that you weren't able to help because of the fall or? That is a great question. I don't have the numbers today, but we do have data on the number of individuals that were like waitlisted, that we were referred to our crisis center, but we weren't able to access due to needing a waitlist. The other hard part that makes that number um, difficult to get is that just because we didn't have services available to them doesn't mean that we didn't make a referral to another resource and get them into that uh, that level of care. So um, we work, uh, again, where the collaboration comes in, we work re alongside all of our community partners to try to find the level of care that someone might need. Um, and uh, that would make that number just a little bit difficult, but yeah. Um, sorry. And I mentioned this uh, earlier, but the top three reasons for seeking services you can see here are depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation. So individuals that are accessing CERC, um, we, one of the questions that we ask them uh, when they're initially coming in for services is what are you coming in for? What, what is, uh, what's the immediate crisis that we are trying to work through? And um, these are the reasons that most individuals coming in and accessing our services are citing. Now I do want to tell you a little bit about what the service looks like and kind of paint a picture for you, if you will. Um, we have a parent that brought their teenager to CERC seeking help for suicidal ideation. CERC addressed the immediate crisis, kept the teen safe in residential for a few days, and worked with the family to refer them to a long-term therapist in the community. That's one um, story about the impact that CERC has made. Um, another that I could give you is a woman arrived um, at CERC for help with anxiety, panic attacks, and suicidal thoughts. She was also at risk of losing her housing. CERC provided residential care for 10 days, worked with Mayo to reestablish medication, and helped her create a plan to address her panic attacks. CERC also provided her housing resources to get her connected within the community, and she thanked our, our CERC staff for not giving up on her. Um, and if I give you just one more, a man uh, came into CERC dealing with um, concerns around substance use and having difficulty with everyday living due to a divorce and some other stressors. He stayed at CERC in our residential for a few days. He worked on his sobriety, building his coping skills, talking with our staff. He worked with our psychiatry staff that we have. Um, and we were able to connect him with long-term chemical dependency program and a therapist in the community. When he left, he was sober, exercising, and said he was actually feeling happy for the first time in a long time. Um, and he said his family had noticed the difference too. There's nothing more powerful than hearing about how the, the work that we do impacts those around <coughs> us. And what I'd love to show you now is uh, someone who was personally benefited from the services at CERC. So I have a brief video. Um, we're really grateful to Philip um, for sharing his story and his experiences in this video. I went through a lot of professional struggles, uh, so I'm sure a lot of people did, especially during the pandemic. Uh, but mine ended up culminating in some what I've been referring to as professional abuse. <coughs> After about a week of training, um, it all kind of hit the fan, and uh, they plopped me in the job, repeatedly had me running the store by myself uh, with one week of training for a job that needs four weeks of training. And the stress began to build. And it got to the point where uh, I was telling my at the time supervisor, this cannot continue. You guys aren't treating me properly. I can't handle this. And over the next couple of days, I started thinking about how I could make it stop. And so every day on the way home from work, I started looking for where I was going to run my car off the road. I had decided tomorrow's the day. And 
at that moment, I'm working in the middle of a panic attack, and my wife walks through the front door of the business just to visit me. And um, I think it was just her presence that kind of put just a tiny crack in the wall, and I just, everything collapsed. Uh, my emotional, mental fortitude, and I told her that um, I need to go to Cirque. I think a lot of people are really vulnerable in, in the sense of being in crisis, and whether that's defined as you're having anxiety or going through depression or going through a divorce or really struggling with a child that's having aggressive behaviors, you know, we meet people exactly where they are. We are the voice to really acknowledge that people are being hurt. We are here to provide help and really to just open up the opportunity for individuals to bring forward something that's going on and, and recognize that we are here to make a difference in their lives. Once I've kind of gone through that initial uh, moment and I've been able to calm down breathe my way through this panic attack, this almost, this very gentle white glove service started. Um, the mental health professional did my intake with me, learned as much as they could about me, just from even, it, was, it seemed like such a short amount of time, but together they were able to get so much information. But I think it's because they made me feel so comfortable. Um, and then once my intake had done it, they were like, yes, we think you should stay. We agree, let's, let's, let's move forward. Um, they walk you to the next person. Every person that you were with during the intake walks you to the next person, which felt great. It's not like this hallway, you take a left here. They're, they're, each person is handing you off making sure you're okay. I went through the these double doors and saw, that, yeah, uh, for the way I've described it since then, it felt like I went on a mental health vacation. The, the staff, as soon as you walk in, their eyes light up, they smile, they welcome you in. Um, and then uh, they talk about, okay, you know, let's talk about what you want to do while you're here. I said, well, I don't feel safe going home. I don't feel safe sticking around. They help me find a room. And then they just let me get settled in. By the time I was leaving, after staying a couple of nights and kind of getting into a new routine, I felt so much different. I felt safe for the first time in a long time. I felt like the whole world didn't rest on my shoulders because they were telling me, like, hey, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to be Superman to survive. You know, sometimes surviving is enough. And they started kind of pointing me in the direction of where I could learn those skills to survive. Again. There are so many places and so many companies and so many businesses that are so very clinical that a lot of them have lost sight of how deeply people that they are helping feel everything that is happening around them. And everyone here has been so sensitive and so careful and so attentive. Just, you know, is this okay if I do this? Can I take a moment to ask you some questions? If Cirque wasn't here, I, I, I probably wouldn't be here to be here. And so I would tell other people, if you need help, even if it's uh, up to and including crisis, these people can help and, and help in an incredible way.
uh, and I'm privileged to be here with you today. Uh, part of the reason I even took this job is because I believe in the work and the value of mental health, and I want to see the communities uh, that we're at come around, the families and friends and neighbors, and create a better place for all of us as a community. You know, as we see these stories, these are our coworkers, these are our kids, these are our aunts, uncles, friends, family members. And I've talked to some of you in the room even who have said, part of the reason I came tonight is because we had our own story that connected us with this in our own family's life. Uh, and so we're all in this together, trying to figure out a way how can we create uh, a better world for our communities. And so thank you for being here and helping us with this. Uh, we've had some great organizations that have helped CERT become what it is. So we heard from Clemens Mayo has been amazing. Um, we also have had so many other partners that have helped us get, get this off the ground, Olmstead Medical, as well as many counties that come around and make this happen. And we've also had businesses that have invested in CERC. Uh, Red Wing, Think Bank, and many other organizations have invested their funds in also creating, or helping CERC become what it is, uh, because they believe in what we're doing as well. And we have so many individual donors that have come forward too. Some of them have donated in memory of people they have lost, and it's in a way of saying we don't want this to happen to other people, and we want to be a part of creating better solutions in our community for this. And we're grateful for all of those. The reality is we still need community support to create the resources and the access to every family who wants to come through these doors, for every individual who wants to come through these doors. We don't want to create barriers, and we want people to empower them. And part of what the Nexus Foundation wants to do is come around those families and those individuals and make sure that that's the last thing they have to worry about is where they're going to get the resources from to get the help they need. And so if you have connections, if you have organizations, you're a part of a business, you have friends and family that would, you think would benefit or be interested in this, we would love to hear from you. I would love to talk to you. My goal is that the entire community comes around this place and supports us so that our whole uh, community is able to be supported here. So as we wrap up, there's a few different ways you can help that are immediate that I'm gonna walk you through. Uh, actually, I think the next picture is my face, which you do not need to see. Okay, we're gonna skip that one. All right, you see me right here, we're good. Okay, so the first one is um, just sign up so you can learn more. We have social media that you can get plugged into. Uh, we also have a newsletter that we would love for you to subscribe to so you can hear more about what's going on in our community. Uh, and then also, I would, I would love to talk to you. Uh, you can get my email address or my number. I'd love to um, connect with you as well. And then also, I think it's really powerful, but you can go by CERC, you can go visit, and you can take a tour and see what the facilities are like. I think that's a great way to know what's kind of what you're sending people to or what you're recommending them to go to. Often in these situations, it's a crisis. We don't plan for it, we don't expect it, and then it happens. And so the more we can be informed, the more our communities can be informed of what that's like, the easier and more able we are able to respond in a way that's helpful and immediate for the people that might need help. So it's a great way uh, to kind of get informed. So learn more, plug in with us. Uh, the next one that we would love for you to do is share the story. Tell your friends, tell your families, if you're in a faith community, tell the faith communities, part of a rotary, share it with a rotary, and we would love to come out and share more with those communities as well, so that people know. The most critical thing here is, is that people know that this is a resource in their community and in their neighborhood. We want them to know, again, because when that crisis happens, we don't want them Googling and looking through and being, what should I do, where can I go, they're already panicked enough, and to know that this is a place that I can go immediately is so helpful, so please share that story talk to people, invite us into that conversation as well. Um, we would love to be a part of it. And then lastly, uh, we would love your support. Whether that's financial, whether that's a stock gift, whether that's an in-kind donation, there are so many ways that you can um, support the work that CERC is doing. If you're a part of a company that may have a give back program, we would love to talk about that as well. And if you just have like a group, again, that you would love to invite us to share more about this, that you think would be helpful, Please invite that as well. And then lastly, tonight, of course, you can use this QR code to donate to the work that CERC is doing. Um, and we continue to want to make sure that it is as accessible as possible for every person, no matter their background, no matter what they're going through. We want them to be able to come with no barriers and just worry about taking care of themselves and finding healing. And that's what we're all about. So thank you for helping make that possible. We hope uh, you will enjoy your time here. We have time left, so please eat some more food, get a drink, meet some people that maybe you didn't know before.
But again, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for investing in the work we're doing. Thank you invest for investing in our community, in our neighbors, and our friends, uh, and helping make this place uh, a better world for all of us. So thank you so much for coming tonight. Talk to you soon. Thanks.
I do have one question. So, um, you know, just to, from my experience, there's, there's kids that go into crisis center or adults, and then sometimes you have the right therapy to give them all at home model that they get through with, with the, the, the way it is possible or whatever it is. Um, how many, or what kind of percentage do you have where they need to be placed for a further stay in the 10 day stay that you have? Yeah. That's a cool question. Yeah. So um, that higher level of care, um, or even transfers to the emergency department, are relatively low at the crisis center. Um, the transfers to the emergency department, the last time I checked, were about 10 to 12 percent of our transfers. And that's having sort of be the front door for front people. Door. Mm -hmm. So if, whereas if they would have otherwise gone to the emergency department, they're going to serve only 10 or 12 percent of those things. And then, um, you know, sometimes the higher level of care is appropriate, right? And so um, they may enter a residential and then we're uh, our residential, and then we're attempting to get them into a higher level of care, and that is the end goal. Um, sometimes it is back to the community, but sometimes it is a higher level of care. And then um, most of the time what we're finding is that we're able to place individuals in other community-based programs. So even if it's not the crisis center, it's um, a substance use treatment program. It's an Earth's 90 day program. So you may think of those as uh, longer term or higher levels of care than what CERT is. Um, but still, that is the, that, that would be the end goal or the result of them coming in and receiving the services.